very good morning to all of you. So, uh, today we are going to be uh, covering uh, database design in terms of uh, relational uh, normalization after uh, having finished uh, ER modeling. So, uh, today's uh, coverage looks at uh, relations which have been created either by people starting off and arbitrarily creating a schema or by uh, relations which have been created by first going through the ER uh, normalization, ER design process and then checking for issues in there. However, a lot of the theory which we are going to cover today can be used whether it is with uh, you know ER uh, models or relations or whatever, it is theory which is required regardless. It is a little bit of work understanding this theory and uh, figuring out what is going on. Things may not be obvious first time around, but it is certainly useful even in the real world. Some of the examples we use um, may be a little abstract and I have heard a few people complain that why do not you use real world examples. We do have real world examples, but you should note that um, real world examples are more complex. So, we tend to use simpler ones while we are demonstrating concepts, so that the concepts are easier to understand and we separately use real world examples as motivation. So, there is some uh, work involved in going through this, but it is worth it. Okay. So, let us get going. So, first of all, let us uh, look at the uh, motivation for normalization theory by looking basically at bad designs. So, the best way to learn how not to do something is to first see what went wrong, study what went wrong and then to fix it. And in the process of studying what went wrong, we try to generalize our observations. So, if you treat uh, database design as an art, a uh, person who treats it as an art would look at a particular design and say, hey, there is a problem here and here is how to fix it. And the next time around that you have a new design, you again go to this person who uh, looks at it, stares at it for a while and says, oh, here is a problem, this is how to fix it. But that has not left you necessarily any uh, clearer about what went wrong and how to fix it in general. Whereas, a scientist will look at the same thing and say, look, here is how to fix this particular problem, but here is how to generalize it, to go beyond what we have seen in just this one special case. In fact, a lot of research in whichever area, whether it is uh, databases or uh, any other systems area for that matter, uh, tends to happen in this way. People realize there is a problem somewhere, people in the industry maybe people in academia who have been building stuff, but they realize that there is a problem which seems more general and maybe we should not just fix it by doing a little bit of uh, smart hacking on this one case and then move on, but rather let us look at this problem in more general and see how to improve things overall, so that other areas can benefit. So, that is a key aspect of how research gets done. So, uh, clearly a lot of what we study today was an area of intense research a long time back in the 70s, uh, soon after the relational model came up, people understood that there are issues in uh, database design and came up with a whole bunch of theories to deal with them. And we are going to look at a few of those. In fact, the body of work on uh, the theory of uh, normalization is enormous, it is way more than we can even cover in a full fledged course. So, we are just going to be scratching the surface covering the parts which are the most useful. Okay. So, coming back here is a design which I think any of us would recognize as a bad design. So, what is this design? There is an ID name salary department name that looks familiar. Those are the attributes of instructor, <coughs> but also we have combined it with the department information. So, that for each instructor we get the building in which that department is located and the budget of that department. So, it uh, looks like maybe this design will make it easier to find out which department uh, person is, uh, which building a person is located in and perhaps if you are interested in the budget, how uh, to look it up quickly. So, there may indeed be some performance benefits in some uh, situations, but it would come at a cost and in this case, the cost is repetition of information. So, what is the repetition here? Clearly, the same department name occurs multiple times, 
And since we know that the department name identifies the building in which it is located, regardless of which particular instructor we are talking about, the association between building and uh, department and building does not depend on the instructor, but in this case the department name uniquely determines the building and it uniquely determines the budget. So, now if you look here, uh, every time the same department occurs, say uh, physics is here and down here also, the uh, building which is Watson is repeated, the budget which is 70,000 is repeated. Okay, so, you can say what is a big deal in repeating data? You know, it was a big deal once when disks were very expensive, but today you know uh, one terabyte disk is cheap. And for most organizations, uh, let us say IIT Bombay, our databases fit comfortably in a few gigabytes of data. This includes even the photos of our uh, students and employees, maybe uh, you know 10 gigabytes. So, it is a big deal, why do we care about wasted space? It is it is actually almost irrelevant today. So, then what is the real problem? The real problem is updates. So, you may start off with a consistent relation, where all occurrences of physics are connected to the same building and budget, but next year the budget of physics department goes up. So, now you have to update it. Now, the problem is that programmers uh, you know will see some other relation perhaps, which contains the um, department name and the budget, the regular department relation and they would go and update the budget over there. So, the query updates the budget. Now, what about this relation here, which also has the same information? Oops, they forgot to update it. The programmer did not realize that that information was replicated in this relation. Even in this relation, the programmer might have uh, you know written an update, uh, which updates one row, but not another. So, within the same relation, you may have inconsistency. So, the moment you have repetition, there is scope for inconsistency. If you do not have repetition, if an update happens, we know it will update the only copy of that data, therefore, it is safe. Now, redundancy is actually useful in uh, certain situations. For example, uh, almost all uh, data storage systems today will keep at least two copies of the same data on different disks. And the reason for this redundancy is that if one disk fails, the data is still safe on the other disk. So, redundancy by itself may not be a bad thing, but the problem is you have to keep multiple copies, the redundant copies in sync. And if the database system or the underlying disk subsystem is in charge of keeping all these copies in sync, life is not so bad. It is not the job of the programmer and the database developer or the disk uh, or the file system developer took care to make sure things are consistent. But if each programmer has to deal with this, then there is a problem. So, that is what causes real problems with redundancy. Okay, so, we saw there is redundancy here. Now, uh, here is uh, another example, just like the previous one, where we combine two schemas, but it turns out here there really is not a problem. So, what are the two schemas? We had a section uh, entity set, uh, which had a uh, course ID, which it actually got from the identifying entity set. So, it is primary key, it is a weak entity, but when you convert it to a relation, it is primary key is course ID, section ID, semester, year. That entity set also had a relationship with the classroom, which basically said, uh, where does this uh, thing live? Um, actually, this example is bad in some sense, because section ID does not uniquely identify uh, building and room number. Um, I do not know how this got in here, but if you want the section to be uniquely identified, you actually end up with all of these attributes. So, to uniquely identify it, you will need course ID, section ID, semester, year will identify the section and building and room number uh, are where it meets. In fact, that particular relationship, uh, if you recall, the section to classroom relationship did not have any attributes. So, the only attributes of the relation which we create from it are the primary keys of the two sides. The primary key for classroom would be uh, building and uh, room number and the primary key for this is the set of four attributes. 
So, now if we combine these two relations, what we get is the original section relation we looked at in the first place before we got into ER modeling, which has course ID, sec ID, semester, year, building and room number. So, here too we have combined two schemas, but here there really is not a problem. In fact, in our um, university schema, we have actually combined this. So, what is the difference? Why did we run into a problem in one case, but not in the other? And that is exactly what we seek to figure out by trying to understand what are constraints on data. And we are going to see that in a moment. Now, going the other way, you may say, well, we have a certain uh, set of relations. What if we break them into smaller pieces? So, basically when you uh, have a schema, what you can do is combine relations or part, uh, break them up. Or you can first combine them and then break them up in a different way. So, there are many things you could do. Uh, so, we have seen cases where combining two relations causes redundancy and causes repetition. We have seen cases where combining relations really does not cause a problem. Now, how about the other way? If we take a relation which we are given and break it up into parts, is that going to cause a problem or is it not? So, breaking a relation into parts is called decomposition. So, when we look at decomposition, most of the time we will be looking at binary decomposition, where we split a relation into two parts. However, in general decomposition may split it into multiple parts. Now, of course, the parts will generally have overlapping attributes, because otherwise the parts will uh, cannot be joined in any meaningful way. Okay. So, now, take uh, this thing. Um, we have uh, this combined schema and uh, instructor and department, let us say. And now, if you look at this relation, we see that it has attributes department name, building and budget. And we know that department name uniquely identifies the building as well as the budget. So, that particular property that in that schema, if a department name repeats, it must have the same building and budget at for each repetition. In other words, in that relation, in any legal instance of that relation, uh, the department name must uniquely identify building and budget is expressed as a functional dependency, which is listed here. Now, uh, if you look at this particular relation, as we saw before, it has a repetition. And in fact, the original schema, we could get by simply decomposing this. So, supposing somehow a designer started with this combined schema. What we would like is to be able to figure out that we can actually decompose it into those other two schema and show that that particular decomposition is, will not cause any problem. So, what problems could arise? So, certain decompositions may lose information and they are called lossy decompositions. So, here is an example of a lossy decomposition. Uh, this time we have an employee relation with ID, name, street, city and salary. And suppose we decompose this into two relations. One has ID name, the other has name, street, city and salary. Is there anything wrong with this particular decomposition? In fact, uh, assuming that names can occur multiple times, meaning multiple employees can have the same name, this decomposition is bad. Um, why is that? Here is a simple example. Uh, there are two different employees named Kim with two different IDs and, uh, and of course, their street, city and salary could be different. So, this is the relation we started off with, the employee relation. Now, supposing we decomposed it into two parts, one is ID name, the other is name, street, city, salary. What are the tuples in those two relations? So, if this was the original set of tuples, the decomposed relations would have these tuples. This one has 57766 Kim and 98776 Kim. Similarly, this one has Kim Main Perry Ridge and this has Kim North Hampton and associated salaries. So, this is the state after decomposition. Now, what is the common attribute here? It is name. So, if we take these decomposed relations and join them back, it would be a natural join uh, on uh, the shared attribute being name. So, what do we get back here? We have a slight problem. 
we get this I D 57766 skim paired with both these rows. And similarly, the 98776 skim is also paired with both these rows. So, what has happened? We started with two tuples. When we joined back, we got four. Hey, why is that lossy? It seems to be gaining tuples. Sure, it gained tuples, but what was lost was information. And what is the information we have lost? The information we have lost is the information that 57766 lived on main Perry Ridge, whereas 98776 lived in Northampton. Now, if you look here, we do not know. 57766 is associated with both these addresses in Salvis, and similarly, the other one, 98776 is associated with both addresses in Salvis. Now, which is the correct one? We have no way to figure out from this relation state. So, a lossy decomposition loses information, but in fact, it is easy to show that it will only gain tuples. Every tuple which was there in the original relation will exist in the new one after joining back, but there may be extra tuples. So, we want to make sure that if we decompose a relation, it is lossless joint. So, here is another small example of a relation and its decomposition. Now, in this case, we had uh, R A B C, which we decompose into A B and B C. If we join it back, in this case, we get alpha 1 A, beta 2 B, which is in fact the original relation. So, on this particular example, this particular decomposition is lossless. But can we generalize? You know, can we say, given any relation R, we can decompose it like this? And the answer is, of course, no. You can easily have instances of R where the decomposition would be lossy. So, what we want is not just for a particular instance of a relation, but we want to be sure that any legal instance of a particular relation can be decomposed in a lossless fashion. So, um, the way we can uh, argue about this for the general case is to look at constraints on relations and a constraint is a property that a relation should satisfy. We would say that a relation is legal if it satisfies those properties. And then we can say that in the real world, a particular relation satisfies those properties. Therefore, those are constraints in that relation. Then we can say, under these constraints, we can show that a particular decomposition will be lossless. And we are going to see in a little bit how to do this. So, uh, if you observe here, I am jumping a bit fast over several topics without getting into the details. In fact, I am going to get into the details, but my goal in the first part of the talk is to give an overview of normalization, uh, uh, the, the different uh, uh, things that go into normalization theory. So, you get an overview and then go into details. And the reason for this is that the details are fairly uh, long and take some time to understand. And if you do not understand why you are doing it, um, you know, most of us as teachers uh, kind of accept that uh, if something is hard, it could still be useful, uh, because somebody else is saying it could be useful. Unfortunately, this generation of students that we have uh, does not believe that. They do not believe us. And that can be good and it can be bad. It can be good, because some of the things we say are surely wrong. Each generation uh, comes up with uh, new scientific theories which essentially show that the previous generation did something maybe not completely wrong, but not in exactly the right way and improve upon how to do things. So, that is required. On the other hand, if we try to stuff a whole bunch of a theory down their throats, uh, many of them rebel and do not bother to pay attention. Um, so, that is why we have tried to put a whole bunch of motivating things up front before getting into details. The second reason is, um, in, at least in certain places, probably not in this gathering, but certain courses, uh, which are not for engineering degrees, but for other degrees, may not want to give their students all the details of what we do. They want a high level overview, but their students do not need all the details. In which case, the first part of the chapter is really enough to give an overview of what are the issues, with, and then the details can be skipped. Okay. Now, coming back. Um, we had mentioned uh, early on in this course something about first normal form. So, uh, we said that a domain is atomic if it cannot be broken up. So, 
uh, coming back here, uh, here we say that it is atomic, if its elements are considered to be indivisible units. Note this um, word considered. I am not saying they are indivisible units, because any time you give anything, it can be divided up in some way or the other, and we will see how. But the point here is that in the database design and in the application, you do not break it up in arbitrary ways, which can cause trouble. So, what is a non atomic domain? A set of names would certainly be a non atomic um, domain. What, what is a domain? Um, I should be a little bit careful here. A domain is a set of values that an attribute can take. A value of the domain is a particular value. What we want to make sure is that the values in the domain are atomic, that they are not broken up. So, if I have a attribute name, the domain of name is a set of all possible names, but an individual name is a single name and that will not be broken up, let us say. Um, but if you treat name as a composite attribute uh, with first name, last name, then it would be broken up and it would not be atomic. Another example is uh, identification number for a course like C S 101. Is it atomic? Um, you can actually take out the first two digits uh, letters and figure out that this is from the computer science department. You can pull out the first number and say it starts with 1 and most probably it is a first year course. These are all things which people have used in creating the identifier. However, what we do not want is for the database or the application to be doing such things. And there are good reasons for this. Um, if they start decomposing it into parts, then the only way to link up a course with its department is to first pull out the first two characters and then link it up. Now, this causes problems. When I write a query, instead of directly joining a course with its department, I will have to pull out the first two characters and then equate that with the department code in the department relation. So, that makes writing queries more difficult. It makes uh, building indices on these relations more difficult. Everything gets complicated. So, what we want is any such relationship should be you know explicit in the form of attributes, not buried in the middle of an existing attribute. So, that is why we want things to be treated in an atomic fashion. Now, a relation schema is in first normal form if the domains of all attributes are atomic. So, non atomic domains can complicate storage. The one of the reasons that first normal form was stressed upon in from the very beginning of relational uh, database theory is that the previous generation of databases, uh, the hierarchical and network uh, data models actually encourage people to create sets of things. Uh, so, you can say here is a student and the student has a set of courses they are registered for and uh, in fact, the nesting could go further down. Mm. Each of these courses may have a set of teachers and so forth. It turned out that this kind of uh, things which are sets um, made writing queries rather complicated. So, the query is tended to be in what are called navigational queries, which is say first uh, go follow this pointer, then go here, then do something, then come back up and then do something else. So, the queries were rather complicated to write, which is not a good thing. On the other hand, when we take such structures and convert them to a first normal form, querying in general actually becomes easier, although there are certainly some queries which become more complicated. So, we are going to assume first normal form. However, people did realize there are certain applications which uh, would like sets of uh, values for an attribute and they went back and added these features in object relational database systems. So, this is like the go to construct if you have heard of it. The go to construct uh, was the basic way of writing uh, loops if then else originally, it is the assembly level construct, which was mapped into programming languages. And when people started using it in writing high level programs, the programs were often very, very hard to understand. So, they were called spaghetti code, because there were go to's all over the place. And nobody could figure out what the hell a particular piece of code is doing. So, at that point, uh, there was a lot of noise about structured programming. And programmers were told, do not use go to. 
use for loops, while loops, if then else and so on, which made a lot of sense. Today it seems natural to us, but one generation of programmers had to be forced to give up the go to statement and start using these. On the other hand, there are actually a few cases where a go to is actually useful. So, there were languages which completely banned the go to statement, but uh, other languages took a pragmatic view and said, hey, sometimes we need go to and we will keep it in the language, but tell people do not use it unless you have to. So, I would say the same about non atomic domains. Today's uh, databases, including uh, PostgreSQL, Oracle, uh, and others, do support set valued attributes. However, use those with care. Do not use them uh, just like that. Use them only if you know that there is a good reason for not staying in first normal form. As I said, atomicity is a property of how a value is used. So, in our database uh, data, we are using uh, values like CS101. Then, would we say that the domain is not atomic because we can break it up? The answer is no. As long as we do not actually break it up, we just treat it as a string. We are not interpreting it in the database or the application. A human might well interpret it. That is the problem of the human. That is not part of the database design. So, in particular, if I want to associate a course with a department, in the course table, I have a department name attribute. I do not pull out the first two uh, characters of course and then use that. As another example, uh, at one time, uh, IIT Bombay uh, used the uh, roll number, which had eight characters and every pair of characters in there had a meaning. And in fact, they used to extract two digits from a roll number to find out which department a person was in. Uh, this caused a serious problem. Uh, in fact, there, were, uh, there was another digit which said whether for an MTech student, this person was a uh, teaching assistant or uh, what we call self-sponsored, meaning they did not have a scholarship or certain other uh, categories of uh, scholarships. Each of this was encoded in one particular digit. So, now programs would extract that digit from the roll number to figure out something about this person. But this caused a serious problem. The moment a person um, changed, let us say, from uh, non scholarship to scholarship status, their roll number changes. Not only does that digit change, it turned out if you just change the digit, the remaining part might clash. So, the whole roll number could change, several digits could change. And this caused havoc because I would be teaching a course and um, I see a particular roll list at the beginning of the semester. And when it comes time to submit grades at the end of the semester, I see certain roll numbers have vanished and certain roll numbers have mysteriously appeared. Well, what do I do? I look at the name and match it. If uh, the situation was such that there were two, let us say, Sanjay Jains, both of whom changed the status, I would be in soup. I would not know which one was which one. So, that is a very bad scheme, where a primary key itself changed because digits in the primary key were interpreted. So, there was, so, uh, you know, I and others uh, who understood database systems had to fight against an administration which insisted on coding digits. And eventually, we sort of won the battle. It is not completely won because when a student is joins IIT, they still set those digits, but those digits are no longer interpreted which means of course, it, uh, you know, humans are still interpret those digits and think this person is in this program, but actually that person is in some other program. So, it, it turns out that was a bad idea. We should have not done such things in the roll number. In the primary key in particular, we should not be interpreting pieces and then regretting it when we are forced to change a primary key because of this interpretation. Okay, so, that was a very practical uh, issue with first normal form and it does come up many times. So, you have to watch out for it. Now, coming back, our goal uh, in the major part of today's lecture is to establish the theory which lets us decide what is good and what is bad. And we are going to have a, a situation where we start off with relations which are too big and then decompose them. Now, it turns out that life is not so easy. If you started off with a set of relations which you had accidentally decomposed into too small a piece, the theory does not tell you anything about how to go and undo your decomposition, which you did in the first place. So, 
in some sense the theory is biased towards starting off with uh, relations which have not been decomposed at all, which and then decomposing them. That is how we are going to study it. Um, but occasionally the other opposite problem arises. In fact, uh, if you go back, uh, the theory started off with a concept of what is called a universal relation. Where they said, let us just have one single table representing everything in the world. Of course, that is a crazy way of doing things. Nobody in their uh, right mind would actually store all data in a single table. But theoreticians said, let us go to that extreme. Let us start with a single table which contains everything of interest. And now, let us see what is wrong in that table, what repetition occurs and then partition it. So, what they did is ensure that you never started off with something which was already decomposed into pieces. Unfortunately, uh, even writing this single uh, mega relation which all attributes is ridiculously confusing for programmers. So, in real life, we cannot do that. We end up with some design which we started off with and then we decompose. And there is no guarantee that the initial design had not already decomposed in a wrong way. What do you mean by decomposing in a wrong way? Well, we saw what is a lossy decomposition. If your original schema when you started off before you normalized already was decomposed in a lossy fashion, then we have problems. Certain information cannot be represented in the database if you do that. Okay, so, now coming back, uh, we want to know when a relation is in a good form, meaning it does not have certain kinds of redundancy and that is based on a theory of functional dependencies. We uh, briefly intuitively saw what is a functional dependency, we are going to see it formally now and also something called multivalued dependencies and some more details are there in the book, we will briefly mention it at the end. In fact, there are other kinds of constraints too, which theoreticians have looked at and come up with normalization theories, which take into account other kinds of constraints. In practice though, these are the first, uh, two most commonly used forms and in particular functional dependencies are by far the most commonly used and so we are going to focus our efforts on those. So, as I said, a functional dependency is a constraint on legal relations. Um, that is what it means is, it is a constraint that every legal relation will satisfy. If a relation does not satisfy that constraint, it is illegal, it should not have occurred. And it requires that a value for a certain set of attributes uniquely determines the value for another set of attributes. And it is in fact, a generalization of the notion of super key, we will see how. So, we are going to use the capital uh, letter R to denote the schema of a relation, which we will refer to the relation using small letters, small r and the schema using capital letters. What do we mean by the schema here? Earlier, we said that this uh, schema in SQL includes uh, relation names, types and other stuff. Here, we are going to uh, just treat the set of attributes as the schema and the constraints are also there, but they are separate from the schema. So, now, uh, let us uh, suppose we are given a relation small r with a set of attributes capital R constituting its schema and we will use the terms alpha and beta to denote subsets of the set of or full set of attributes of the relation R. Notice that we are saying over here subset of or equal to because in certain cases alpha or beta might include all the attributes in R. So, it need not be a strict subset. Now, we say that a functional dependency alpha functionally determines beta holds if and only if for any legal relation R on R. What is this notation? Small r in brackets capital R means that the relation small r has the schema specified by the set of attributes R capital R and when I say legal relations, anything which satisfies the constraints. Um, whenever any two tuples T 1 and T 2 agree on attributes alpha, then they must also agree on beta. That is, if there exists two tuples in that relation T 1 and T 2, such that the alpha values are the same, then their beta values must also be the same. So, here is an example of R A B and if you notice here, there are two tuples with the same value for A, but they have different values for B. So, we can be sure that 
this instance does not satisfy A functionally determines B. How about the other way? On this instance, does B functionally determine A? It does uh, kind of trivially because there are no two tuples with the same B, but still the definition holds. Therefore, B functionally determines A on this instance. Now, note that this is for this particular instance, whereas um, we uh, need to talk not only about a current or particular instance, but all legal instances. That is where functional dependencies are really useful. So, now um, we can express the notion of a super key in terms of a functional uh, dependency. So, if I have a k a set of attributes, is a super key for relational schema capital R, R is the set of all attributes, if and only if k functionally determines R. Therefore, if two tuples agree on the attributes in k, then all the remaining attributes must be the same. Uh, it turns out this is not exactly the case when we have multi sets in SQL, because in SQL when you declare something as a primary key, um, it cannot have copies, whereas when you have a multi set, copies are allowed. However, in a multi set, it turns out that a functional dependency may still hold, alpha may still, uh, k may still functionally determine r. That is, um, if there are two tuples in the multi set, which agree on k, they will agree on all the remaining attributes too, that is fine, but that does not mean that k is a primary key in this multi set case, because there are two copies of the same tuple. But in the normalization theory, which we are focusing on, it generally assumes that things are set value. Uh, it is not, it does not uh, generally deal with multi sets, although you can uh, argue about the same things in the context of multi sets. So, to keep our life simple, we are also going to focus on sets. It turns out that the most database schemas in the, uh, which we create an SQL actually do have primary key attributes defined. Therefore, those relations are sets, they are not multi sets. So, the schemas which we come up with, it is perfectly fine to deal with sets and not worry about multi sets, even though SQL allows multi sets. So, we are not going to use that feature in terms of our schema design. Okay. So, now we can also argue about what is a candidate key. K is a candidate key for R if and only if, of, first of all, K must functionally determine R, therefore it is a super key. Furthermore, no alpha which is a subset, note here that it is a strict subset, not equal is missing. No alpha which is a strict subset of K uh, satisfies alpha functionally determines R. In other words, K is minimal, you cannot remove anything from K while still retaining its property of being a super key. So, uh, we could express super and candidate keys in terms of functional dependencies. But functional dependencies are more powerful than super keys. Now, take this particular relation, instructor department, which we saw before. It has ID name, salary, department name, building and budget. For this, what is the super key? ID is a super key. Department name is not a super key, because there are many tuples with the same department name. So, there is no way using super keys to express the property that department name uniquely identifies building and budget, but using functional dependencies we can. So, on this relation we will say that department name uh, functionally determines building, in fact it also functionally determines budget and we could even say, we, we know that ID functionally determines name salary and department name. We can even figure out that ID functionally determines building, but we are not going to uh, come up with you know department name functionally determines salary, because that does not make sense. There can be two people in the same department with different salaries. So, as I said we use functional dependencies sometimes to see if a particular relation satisfies the functional dependency. So, that is the notion of satisfies, but the real use for it is as a constraint on the set of legal relations in which case we say that F holds on a relational schema R, if all legal relations in R satisfy the functional dependencies in the set F. Again note the notation, we will use capital F to denote a set of functional dependencies. As we saw, 
a schema may have multiple functional dependencies and f in general is a set of functional dependencies. Again, a particular instance may happen to satisfy a functional dependency. For example, name may functionally determine id on some instance, but there may be another instance where two people have the same name, in which case on that instance it will not satisfy this. Therefore, we cannot say that name determines id holds, name determines id does not hold on that relation schema. Now, uh, there is a class of functional dependencies which are trivial because they will hold always. In particular, if you have a functional dependency alpha determines beta, if beta is a subset of alpha, clearly if two tuples agree on alpha and beta is a subset of alpha, they will agree on beta also. It is obvious. It will, it holds regardless of the schema, it will always hold. Therefore, these things are called trivial, they do not add any new information. So, id name obviously determines id, name determines name, no big deal, so they are trivial. Now, some more notation, uh, we are going to deal not only with functional dependencies as given, but also we can figure out that given certain dependencies, others must hold. So, as a very simple example. If A functionally determines B and B functionally determines C, then we can infer that A functionally determines C. Now, how can we infer this? Well, think this through. If two tuples agree on A, then they agree on B, they have the same value. Now, because of the second functional dependency, B functionally determines C, these two tuples will also have the same C value. In other words, what we just proved is, if two tuples have the same A value, they will also have the same c value. Then by the definition of functional dependency, A functionally determines c holds. So, we can infer such things and prove them from first principles based on the definition of functional dependency. So, uh, we are going to see how to do this in a more systematic way, but we can already define the set of all functional dependencies which are logically implied by f. We are going to call it the closure of f and we are going to use the notation f plus, where f is a set of functional dependencies. f plus denotes the closure that is all functional dependencies that can be inferred from f. Of course, f will be included, but there are also others potentially. So, f plus is clearly a superset of f. So, now having uh, introduced the notion of a functional dependency in a more formally, we can define certain normal forms. The first normal form well, first normal form we have already seen. People also defined something called a second normal form, which is not of interest anymore. Um, so, we are skipping that. And then people define what is called third normal form, which we are actually going to see later. Um, but it turns out that uh, more uh, intuitive normal form, which is also more useful, um, is something called Boyce chord normal form, and it is defined as follows. A relation schema R is in BCNF with respect to a set F of functional dependencies if for all functional dependencies in F plus, that is not only those in F, but also consider everything in F plus. Then for all functional dependencies there, if the any one of them is of the form alpha goes to beta, uh, where obviously alpha and beta have to be subsets of R for it to be relevant to R. So, um, in general, the functional dependencies may involve attributes from other relations also, not just in the given relation R, but we will take F plus overall and then see for anything where alpha and beta are both contained in R. So, this is a functional dependency on attributes just in R, um, then one of the two following must hold. Either it is a trivial dependency that is beta is a subset of alpha or alpha is a super key for R. So, alpha is a super key means that no two tuples can have the same value for alpha. If this is true, we can be sure that beta is not going to get unnecessarily replicated. So, if you could have two tuples with the same alpha, then they must have the same beta and that is repetition of information. Whereas, here that kind of repetition will not occur once this is satisfied. So, coming back to our inst department schema, um, the functional dependency department name determines building and budget um, actually shows that this violates BCNF. Why? Is it trivial? It is not. 
beta is certainly, which is building budget, is not a subset of department name. Is it a super key for R? That is, is alpha, which is department name, is it a super key for R? No, it is not. We know that there are many instructors with the same department name. So, department name is not a super key. So, what we have just shown is that given this functional dependency, this schema does not satisfy BCNF. Okay, so far so good. We have shown what we saw intuitively. We saw intuitively there is a problem. What we have done is we formalized this uh, constraints in terms of functional dependencies. And using the theory of functional dependencies, we show that you know, with constraints which we expect to hold in the real world, there will be repetition of information. It, it does not satisfy Boyce called normal form. What do you do now, given that you have found there is a problem? And the answer is, you are going to decompose. The solution for all problems in normalization theory is to decompose. So, we are going to decompose R into parts. So, in particular, if we found a particular functional dependency, alpha goes to beta, which shows that BCNF is violated, uh, what we are going to do is decompose R into two schemas. One contains alpha and beta. The other contains R minus beta minus alpha. Now, what is this minus beta minus alpha? R should contain all attributes in alpha. What you remove from R are those attributes of beta, which are not in alpha. Now, this basically handles the case where a functional dependency repeats attributes on the left and right. This theory will hold even in that case. Um, so, in our example, there was no such repetition from left and right. So, beta minus alpha is building comma budget. So, the two schemas we get are alpha union beta, which is department name building budget. And the other one, where we remove building budget from the schema is id name salary department name. Note that alpha is common between these two. So, when we do a join, the join will be on alpha. Note also that after this decomposition, we have actually got back our original schema. And so, in this example, we know things are okay. But in general, uh, we have to be a bit careful. How do we know that decomposing like this is not lossy? How do we know it is lossless? In fact, it has been shown uh, that uh, is coming up a little bit later, that uh, whenever you decompose on the basis of a functional dependency like this, the decomposition can be guaranteed to be lossless. So, this kind of decomposition is safe and it avoid, it ensures that uh, repetition is removed. Okay. So, so far so good. Um, now, if we decompose, we get rid of repetition. But avoiding repetition is not the only job of a database system. The database system also has to enforce integrity constraints on the database. So, if you declare a functional dependency as an integrity constraint, um, then it ought to be the job of the database system to make sure that whenever an update happens, that functional dependency is satisfied. It turns out as a matter of fact that SQL does not have support for functional dependencies other than uh, super key definitions, uh, but still uh, the theory uh, is useful in general. Um, so, the point is if the database supported uh, the notion of functional dependencies in the full form and SQL does partially, although not completely, then when you do an update, the database must enforce those constraints. SQL does enforce super key declarations, primary key and unique declarations. Now, it turns out that um, if you have taken a particular relation and decomposed it, if you look at individual relations and check if they satisfy whatever functional dependencies hold on those relations, it may not be enough. Um, it may turn out that even though each individual relation satisfies whatever functional dependencies hold on its attributes, a particular update may cause a violation of functional dependency that spans two or more relations. And what will happen in that case is that in order to ensure, what we would like is to ensure the overall set of functional dependencies is satisfied. What we would like is to 
check the functional dependencies that hold on individual relations, because those are easy, easier to check. And then, what we would like is that any functional dependency, which has attributes from two relations, will also be satisfied as a consequence of satisfying whatever holds locally. So, we test locally and show that if these hold, the entire set of functional dependencies will also hold. That is what we would like. Unfortunately, this is not what we may always get. So, we will say that a particular decomposition is dependency preserving. If we do the decomposition, check only functional dependencies that hold on individual relations. And if these functional dependencies can be used to show that all the remaining ones we started off with will hold, then the decomposition is dependency preserving. But not all de uh, decompositions are dependency preserving. In fact, we will see an example later, which shows that for certain relations, there is no way to decompose into BCNF while ensuring dependency preservation. And that is the motivation for this normal form called third normal form, which says, look, there is a trade off. I can either ensure no repetition, but the problem is that certain functional dependencies now become very, it uh, is not very hard, but more expensive to enforce. On the other hand, maybe somebody may take a trade off and say, look, um, repetition can be avoided by checking uh, for functional dependency. So, I will check the functional dependency, I will pay the price, but I will allow repetition. So, what is going to happen is, I am going to reduce the cost of enforcing the functional dependency at the price of allowing repetition. So, that is the trade off. Either you reduce the cost of enforcing and um, allow repetition, or you say, uh, I will not allow repetition, but I will pay more uh, price for enforcing. Those are the trade offs. And that trade off is the trade off between BCNF and 3NF. So, what is third normal form? The idea is that you want to relax BCNF a little bit, just enough so that we can guarantee the following. We can guarantee that for any relation schema with any set of functional dependencies, there is a dependency preserving decomposition. So, that relaxation is actually a very small change. So, here is the definition. A relation schema is in third normal form, if for all alpha determines beta and f plus, at least one of these holds. Either alpha goes to beta is trivial, this is identical to BCNF, or alpha is a super key, this is also identifying uh, identical to BCNF, or this is the last part, which is one alternative. Each attribute A in beta minus alpha for this particular dependency is contained in A candidate key for R. Turns out, you know, that R can have many candidate keys. Each attribute here may be contained in a different candidate key, but that is ok, 3NF allows it. Now, it seems very unintuitive, why on earth do you want to allow this in, you know, how does it matter whether an attribute in beta minus alpha is contained in a candidate key or not. Uh, it turns out this is uh, not obvious why to do this, but if you allow this much, then we can ensure dependency preservation and we are going to see how to do this. So, third normal form is a minimal relaxation of BCNF to ensure dependency preservation. Now, it is obvious that if a relation is in BCNF, then every functional dependency satisfies one of these two things. Therefore, everything which is in BCNF is automatically in 3NF, but the converse does not hold. There are things which are in 3NF, which are not in BCNF. So, to summarize, the goals of normalization are um, to take a relation with a set of functional dependencies. Now, who on earth gives you those functional dependencies? That is part of the design process before you start on normalization. You have to look at what you are modeling and figure out what dependencies hold. Now, is there a, a scientific way of figuring out what dependencies hold? Well, not quite. It is all a matter of what are the rules of the business sometimes or intuitively what is obvious. Uh, most of the cases, you will realize that for a particular entity, you have a primary key 
and that primary key must functionally determine everything, every other attribute of that entity. That is the most common case. But there are other cases, uh, we will see some as we go along, uh, where you really have to look at the enterprise being modeled and figure out what should be a functional dependency and what should not. For example, uh, if you recall, uh, we said that uh, a student takes a course in a semester. So, the takes relation has multiple attributes. Now, if you just start from the ER design and convert to a set of tables, then the um, primary key for takes would appear to be uh, the student ID and all information about the section. So, let me write it here. The primary key for takes, so takes has ID, course ID, uh, section ID, um, then it has semester, year, grade. Now, if we uh, just took the uh, two entities that this relates, which is student and section, then the primary key would include ID, course ID, semester, year and section. It should include that. But then we look more carefully at this enterprise we are modeling and we realize, wait a minute, it does not make sense for a student to be allowed to take two sections of the same course at the same time. Now, why would the student be allowed to take two sections of the same course in different semesters? Well, maybe the student failed it the first time and has to take it again. But you cannot take it in parallel. In the same semester year, you cannot take two different sections. Therefore, we would expect that um, section ID should be uniquely determined by the remaining attributes. In other words, um, if you took all of these things, including section ID, it would be a super key. But even if you dropped section ID, it would still be a super key, because uh, you cannot have two instances of the same person, course, semester, year in the text table. Therefore, uh, section ID can be removed and the minimal thing is ID, course ID, semester, year and this is what we chose as the primary key. Although, if you started from the ER model, we included um, section ID in the primary key, but if you look more closely, you will realize that it should not be there and uh, because of some extra constraints, which we did not quite model in the ER model and then we can modify this. So, this kind of analysis of the application is required to understand what are the uh, functional dependencies. They are not obvious. In this case, it is very easy to not notice this at all until somebody uh, says, wait, you did not enforce this constraint. And when does that happen? Well, when a student uh, enrolls twice for the same course and then somebody finds out, they say, hey, you should not have done that. The student says, hey, the system did not prevent me from doing it and then that is why you realize you did not model the constraint. Then if you go back, you may end up actually changing the uh, design a little bit because of that constraint. On the other hand, uh, you can also make the mistake of enforcing constraints, which perhaps you should not have enforced. What do I mean by you should not have enforced? First of all, I am saying that it is a constraint, which is correct. You do expect it to hold on the schema, but it may not be a rule which will hold forever. So, for example, um, maybe currently in the university, each course is taught by only one uh, instructor. So, you may say each section rather is taught by one instructor. So, you may say that um, in the teacher's relation ID. This is the same thing, course ID, sec ID, semester, year. So, that is the teacher's relation. Again, from the ER model, uh, we would have decided that all of these form the primary key. But now, supposing uh, university has a constraint uh, which says that a particular section can be taught by only one instructor. You cannot have two instructors teaching a section. Then, 
the primary key would not include id it would be the remaining ones if the university changes its mind you can always go back and add id to the primary key and things are okay however if instead of keeping a relation teaches separately you actually folded this into section so instead what we did is i had section uh, course id section id semester year and i threw in an id in that so this is the and then there are other attributes also but in my design if i uh, took that uh, relationship between a section and instructor who teaches that section and said hey each section has only one instructor and i take that as a functional dependency um which i will use in the uh, by the way the many to one and so on is also an instance of a functional dependency so if i have a many to one situation that turns into uh, so if i have a uh, section to instructor the teachers being many to one that is the same as saying that these attributes determine this attribute the primary key of the other side the if primary key of the many side functionally determines the primary key of the one side that's really the same thing so over here if i take this functional dependency and use it to create this schema where id is folded into section then we have a problem if tomorrow the university changes its policy and says um, two people can teach the same section uh, then you say oops what do i do now i have already written all my code assuming this now this is a massive change going back and creating a teachers relation which we would have removed if we folded it in going back and creating it can be a major problem therefore what you may want to do is when you do normalization don't in use functional dependencies which you think may change because that will prevent you from uh, you know introducing that change without changing the whole schema so don't use them for the initial design but you may still enforce them on the schema uh, which you create so for example we keep the teachers relation but enforce the uh, you know the functional dependency in this case it's a primary key uh, dependent uh, constraint actually which is that id is not part of the primary key so we need not have created that relation we could have folded it in but we don't and then we enforce the constraint but tomorrow if the thing changes we remove the constraint that is easy so that is part of uh, the art of uh, database design where you have to check which which functional dependencies are going to uh, hold now and will hold for the future also versus which if you talk to somebody in uh, the administration they will say yes in our uh, university this will hold but if you think about it you realize that they are just talking about rules you know a lot of uh, Uh, staff just look at the current rules and say this is god given well assuming god exists uh, we won't get into that but we'll say that uh, this is a rule that will hold but later they will say oops uh, we told you that but well we changed our mind and now the rule no longer holds so database design must be done using rules which will hold okay so coming back uh so we are going to normalize so each relation schema is in a good normal form the decomposition should be lossless and preferably the decomposition should be dependency preserving and we have a theory of functional dependencies which we are going to study first before coming back to normalization so we have a set of functional dependencies and as i said given a set of functional dependencies we can actually in for other functional dependencies so the closure of uh this thing the closure of f denotes the set of all functional dependencies that are logically implied given the set of dependencies in f so that is f plus how do we find what other dependencies are implied by a given set of dependencies there are in fact two ways of doing or three ways of doing this one is completely from first principles you know every time you look at a dependency and you try to argue uh, in this you know we argued why given ab and bc ac should hold 
So, every time you try to argue why a particular thing should hold, which is not at all systematic. You may miss things, you may make mistakes. So, there are two systematic ways of doing it. Uh, one is to use uh, inference rules. Now, there are many possible inference rules, uh, but three of these were identified as fundamental in the sense that uh, they are minimal, that they are correct and they are minimal, uh, but they are complete. So, what does complete mean? Uh, well, let us first see the rules and I will then tell you what completeness means. So, the Armstrong's axioms are three rules. The first rule says, uh, given any uh, set of attributes beta, subset of alpha, then we can infer alpha functionally determines beta. This is actually the set of all trivial functional dependencies. And this rule to generate all possible trivial functional dependencies is called reflexivity. The second rule says, if you are given alpha functionally determines beta, then if we add some set of attributes to both sides, that set of attributes is denoted as gamma, you add it to both sides, that is called augmentation. So, um, uh, it should be easy to see uh, that if you have two things which agree on gamma and alpha, then because they agree on alpha, they must also agree on beta because of this functional dependency which is given. So, it is fairly easy to show that the augmentation rule is correct. If this holds, alpha determines beta holds, then it is fairly clear that gamma alpha determines gamma beta should also hold. And the last rule is the transitivity rule, which we saw by example. Again, this says if there is any functional dependency alpha goes to beta. Again, note that alpha and beta here can be a set of attributes or a single attribute even. So, if alpha goes to beta, beta goes to gamma, then alpha functionally determines gamma. Uh, again, uh, I gave you a very quick argument for why alpha A functionally determines B and B determines C implies A determines C the same argument holds here. So, it is very easy to show that these three axioms are correct. Now, uh, what is harder to show, but actually holds is that if you apply these axioms repeatedly and make all possible inferences you can given a set of functional dependencies f, you apply these, make every inference you can, it is been shown that every functional data dependency that can be inferred using whatever logical means can be inferred by just applying these axioms over and over again till nothing new can be inferred. Okay? So, that is the notion of completeness. So, these are sound and complete. Now, um, here is a small example of the use of these axioms. So, here is a relation schema with attributes a, b, c, g, h, i and a set of functional dependencies a determines b, a determines c, C g determines h, C g determines i and b determines h. These are given. Now, let us try to infer a few new ones using Armstrong's axioms. So, here is one which we can infer. Given a determines b and given b determines h, we can apply transitivity to infer a functionally determines h. Now, here is one more which is a little harder to do. A g functionally determines i. How do we infer this? Can do we have something very simple to directly go and do it? Turns out we do not, uh, but we can do the following. Uh, we have A determines C, we have that over here. We can use augmentation on this to say that A g determines C g. Now, given A g determines C g, and C g determines i, we have transitivity, which lets us infer A g determines i. So, this is an example where we needed two separate rules to make an inference. In general, you may use multiple of, you may use the same rule multiple times to make more complex inferences. So, multiple rules, multiple times in general. And you keep doing this till nothing more can be determined. So, how do you do this? You start with a set f containing only what is given. Now, you take these three rules. Um, the first rule actually is kind of trivial. You can apply this and generate all trivial dependencies right away. It is a huge number. If you have n attributes, uh, this is of the order of 2 power n different uh, trivial dependencies will be generated straight away. 
So, f immediately blows up. Now, on that set, you can repeatedly do augmentation and transitivity till nothing more can be derived. So, when nothing new can be derived, you are done and that is how you compute f plus. Now, generally speaking, uh, you can write a program to compute f plus, but computing f plus manually is going to be very, very tedious, because there are just so many functional dependencies. It is easy for a computer to list them, you know. A thousand dependencies is nothing for a computer. For a human, it is really painful. So, if you want to do stuff manually, we want to avoid generating f plus, and we will see ways to do normalization without actually computing f plus. Now, note that the conditions for BCNF and 3NF were based on f plus, but we are going to see tricks which will allow us to not compute f plus as far as possible. Okay, now, here is a quick quiz question. Let us read the question. So, given the above dependencies, here is a dependency A B determines B. Now, the options are Given the above, we cannot infer A B determines B. We can infer it using transitivity, we can infer it using reflexivity, or we can infer it using augmentation. So, let me refresh your memory. Reflexivity is this one, it says if beta subset of alpha, then alpha determines beta. Augmentation is this one, alpha determines beta means gamma alpha determines gamma beta, and transitivity we have already seen. So, the options are this particular one cannot be inferred or can be inferred from one of these three rules, which is the correct answer. B is a subset of A B. So, this is inferred using the reflexivity rule. So, the right answer is option 3 or C. So, now uh, here is one more quiz. Uh, before the quiz though, here is uh, here are a few more rules, uh, which are called uh, the union decomposition and pseudo transitivity rules. These rules we are calling additional rules, because they can actually be inferred using the original set of rules. However, if you are uh, uh, you know manually computing closure, you can directly use these rules and you can skip steps to get at what you want to get to. So, what are these rules? Uh, the first one says if you have alpha determines beta and alpha determines gamma, then alpha also functionally determines beta gamma. Again, arguing this from first principles is very easy. Showing it using Armstrong's axioms is not that hard. The second one is decomposition, which is the exact opposite. If you are given alpha determines beta gamma, then again it should be obvious that if alpha uniquely determines B and C, then it must also uniquely determine B and uniquely determine C. There is no doubt about it. So, uh, that is the decomposition rule. And finally, pseudo transitivity, which says um, given alpha determines beta and gamma beta determines delta, then alpha gamma determines delta. If you notice the second inference we made in the previous slide, let me just go back to the previous slide. This one A g goes to i, we actually did using A goes to c and c g goes to i. This was exactly an example of pseudo transitivity. So, we did it in two steps, but if you have this rule, we can directly do it in one step. So, all of these can be inferred from Armstrong's axioms. Let me explain the question. Given a schema R with A, B, C, D with dependencies A goes to B and B goes to C, then which of the following is a candidate key for R? Is it A, A, C, A, D or A, B, D? So, in this case, how do you check if something is a candidate key? First of all, we have to check if it is a super key. Is A a super key? What all can we infer given A? I can certainly infer uh, A determines B. So, B is included, C is included, but if you look here, there is no functional dependency with B on the right hand side. Now, this was purposely thrown in to uh, confuse you a little bit. So, what should be clear is if I take the closure of A, B and C, I will never get D in the closure, because it is not on the right hand side of any functional dependency. Therefore, any correct answer must have D as part of it to make it a super key. So, now the op candidates are A, D and A, B, D. Now, uh, 
if you take A B D, is it a super key? Yes, it is, because uh, given A B D and uh, A determines C, which is given, uh, sorry, B determines C, we can uh, get A B C D. So, it is uh, it is a key, super key. Is it minimal? Well, it is not, because we already have A function A determines B. So, even if we drop B, if we drop B, what we get is option 3, which is A D. And what is the um, set of things determined by A D? Well, we know A goes to B, B goes to C. So, B and C are also determined by A D. So, the closure uh, includes, uh, you know, A D functionally determines A B C D. Therefore, A D is a super key. It is also minimal, because if you drop A or D, there is not much you can infer. Uh, you cannot infer the whole thing. So, the answer is 3. Okay, so, this is a good time to break.